Mike Weddington has had one of the more unique life experiences, let alone professional ones. He's the former 1995 world champion of wakeboarding and now is the co-owner of a medical supply company. Boy, does he have some stories. We talk about his affinity for heavy metal, dropping out of school, becoming world champ where he was making good money only to follow that up with a brief time on government assistance. What you should know about Mike, and I find this among many entrepreneurs, there's a common rebellious nature, yes, but there's never a fear of doing the necessary work. I looked up to Mike as a teenager, and today I'm super proud to call him a friend. This conversation, however, certainly serves as a reminder that we all have friends and family members that have things going on behind the scenes that we may be completely unaware of. And luckily for Mike, his innate will and determination has proven to benefit his thriving business. This is a long pod, but it goes fast, so hit cruise control on that steering wheel or settle in with that beverage and enjoy yourselves. It's a ride. I'm your host, Wesley Smith, and you're listening to the Standard H Podcast. Mr. Michael Weddington Jr. Yes. Do you know, I, I, I didn't even know you were a junior until you had Trey. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I mean, why would I have known? Yeah, I, mean, I, no, I guess known, so, right? I don't, yeah. yeah you were always just Mike to me. Right. I don't use the junior moniker too right. often. So. <laughs> right. right. Um, which is just kind of funny. You've had a lot going on in your life from like childhood to today you know basically working on your second career i would call it right yeah absolutely so, and, and how that morphs and changes and presents itself every day is yeah a trip literally so just as a brief outline let's just talk about former pro wakeboarder now one of two owners of yes. a medical supply company correct correct so obviously that's not you know, necessarily related, <laughs> very unrelated, but weirdly yeah. there's some synergies that, that have crossed over and, and then at this point kind of go backwards in time into, Hey, my time as a wakeboarder and an athlete and doing all that, those things complement so well with the oddly, the, the kind of things that I work in with neurosurgeons and orthopedic spine and stuff like that. Sure. There's somehow some synergy between these things and these physicians respect what I did and I'm able to connect them to some excitement that maybe they wouldn't have had in their kind of day to day. So right. it's a really cool kind of segue, man. But, yeah. But unlikely for sure. That makes a lot of sense, actually. I met you, I think, when I was like 16. Dude, I yeah, I would definitely say 15, 16, yeah, something I was like that. Certainly young. Uh, I think you still had the long hair. Yeah, I would. Yeah, at that time, that would have been yeah. 95. Yeah, for sure. I think 95, um, at the end of 95, I'd cut my hair just to a kind of regular whatever. I don't know what the that standard is. A standard <laughs> Southern gentleman's <laughs> right, guys right, cut. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, but prior to that, certainly 94 leading into 95 was like, like we're talking down to the waist. Yeah, yeah. Waist length long hair just why not why, why not? not all right so let's back up where'd you grow up grew up here in raleigh north carolina uh kind of typical you know regular childhood upbringing but was always akin to the weirder or outlier things whether it be you know skateboarding or surfing or wakeboarding or whatever just something that was you know outside individual and kind of away from the status quo that I kind of grew up and felt kind of a bit constrained by. Sure. Dad was a lawyer. Dad was a lawyer. Mom was a stay at home management team unto herself and uh, just helped me and my sister kind of kick it in the right gear. And my sister, you know, high achiever, big school person has done exceedingly well as a, as a commercial real estate attorney now and kills it here in, in the city and kind of nationally. And, um, you know, I was just not that person. I was not the school person. I think I toured damn near every school in the city. Oh, no way. So yeah. you were all over. Oh, I was all over. How I mean, many high schools did you go to? I did three high schools before I dropped out. No so way. yeah, I dropped out halfway through my senior year. 
because the headmaster and myself decided it might be good if I just pursued my dream of, of a wakeboarder and not finish my my high school career. So obviously you're already wakeboarding at that point then. Exactly, exactly. I had been going down to, during the summers, I had been going to kind of, I had gotten into water skiing up at Lake Gaston where, where you and I met and uh, had my family had a weekend or, or vacation cottage up there and just would uh, water ski and scurf at the time, right? These right. old kind of hybridized surfboards with foot straps to jump and do airs and kind of, you know, random tricks behind the boat and was going down to Florida during the summers to learn to get better at whatever it was, whether it be water skiing, slalom skiing, wakeboarding or scurfing. At so the these time. were like summer camps. Basically. These were like summer camps, man. And I met through those kind of annual kind of pilgrimages down to the central Florida area, met a guy by the name of Eric Perez, who was then the world champion in wakeboarding and Hawaiian dude, super cool, super laid back. And he was like, dude, check this out. And it was kind of the newest iteration of a compression molded board, meaning it was thinner, it was lighter, it was more maneuverable than the kind of fat, you know, roto molded or hand shaped surf style boards. And as soon as I did that, I was like, dude, I'm never touching a water ski. I'm never, this is complete freedom and, and just kind of a, a, an ultimate, you know, high or, or rush in what I wanted to do. Oh, that's sick. So I know you're a big music guy too. Like what were you listening to in those days? So it, it, this has been great, man. Music has, has formed and shaped and inspired me in so many ways. And, you know, a lot of the early stuff, um, you know, talking about like, you know, 13 to 15 to 17, a lot of like hardcore stuff, a lot of thrash stuff, whether it be local people like Corrosion of Conformity or, you know, all the COC stuff was very influential. I used to go to the brewery and sneak in downtown on, on Hillsborough Street when it was around and, and see these thrash bands or people like Slayer and just, you know, just big thrash energy just inspiring stuff like that that was kind of gnarly kind of edgy wasn't mainstream accessible but really was just that that energy and that vibe that, that yeah. kind of fueled me is that what brought the long hair I mean that probably had something to do with it I think prior to letting my parents know that I was going to be a professional wakeboarder which at the time I announced that was still simply a pipe dream I had decided that I was going to be a professional bass player and that was, you know, that was prior to my wakeboarding proclamation, I guess. And so that didn't actually pan out, but I played bass and, and I, had, play I never with knew friends. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in that, you know, as we kind of keep going in our conversation, it's kind of come full circle, man, where, where I'm playing with some people again. And one of my neurosurgeons that I work with now, a guy by the name of Leith Corey, is a virtuoso metal guitar player. What? And he, when he moved to town, he's Jordanian uh, by birth, but was trained at UK in medical school and did his neurosurgical rotation. And, and he's a virtuoso metal guitar. And he, when he came to town, he and I linked up and we started working together and we found out this. And he's like, dude, we got a jam. And so we, we've started jamming and playing and he's played in some local metal bands. And, so some of this stuff, you know, just from back in the day has come full circle and reconnected all this weird journey and trip that you kind of think is, you know, either behind you or times have changed and life has changed and morphed in different ways. But it ends up, kind, you know, being a, another value thing and, and something fun that you can add to a relationship. That's so rad. <laughs> it's, it's pretty killer. I'm man. just trying to think of like. The next time I'm in town, I was like, I got to come to one of these jam sessions. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Like we've got, you know, just a bunch of guys now that get together and jam and and just have a good time. And that's amazing. It's, it's sick, man. It's that's really great. Fun. So as far as the wakeboarding thing came about, you met Eric. But what got you into kind of the, I don't know, scurfing and things like that to begin with? I mean, just to begin just with, like seeing it, seeing it, and it was just another kind of water toy, right? It was, you know, at 
12 or 13 or 14. At that point, it was kind of this raw, undeveloped thing. And just to get behind the boat and nobody was telling you how to do it. It wasn't like water skiing where it was like, okay, you have to do it's this. Like precision. You have to, right, yeah. this precision thing where there's all these rules and regulations and you have to do this. It was just a way to there's kind no of... There's no buoys involved. There's no buoys. It's kind of a, you know, it's a way to throw up your hands and kind of give the finger to the status quo and, hey, I'm going to air out and see what happens when I'm in the air and do some moves and try and be more styly and bring any influence I can from skateboarding or snowboarding or surfing or whatever over to this this new kind of thing yeah totally so did meeting eric is that kind of what pushed you to compete yeah absolutely i think meeting eric it was inspirational in the sense that he was like you know dude you you seemed like you you're really into this thing and let's let's flesh it out a bit and he offered me the opportunity to come back and he was starting a wakeboard school at the time down in i believe it was groveland florida which is just the middle of nowhere central florida but he was doing that in conjunction with um, a water ski school by the name of benzel ski school and he was doing his own own thing but but was going to use their lakes and whatever and he offered me the opportunity to come down and be his basically his boat driver, his gopher, his lackey, his whatever it was for the whole summer. And I jumped at it, right? It was like no money, but come down, I'll feed you, I'll house you, and I will teach you. Yeah, you are probably going down anyway. Dude, right? I was going to go down anyway. I was going to be getting in the water. I was trying to better, you know, my proficiency at this and figure things out. So it was like, man, this is a killer opportunity to go try something out to push myself to learn from then the the best in the world sure and and get better man and hone my skills were you always an athlete did you play stuff growing up because like i really i mean honestly i would like i had said earlier i was really into the individual sport thing and all that i mean you know growing up you kind of do the obligatory soccer thing and you do the do different things. So I was exposed to a lot of things, but none of it was, I was ever very passionate about. I was never very excited or interested in the whole team sports and the, and just the regimen and the rules, you know, once again, I've just got this problem with following predetermined rules and it's kind of held, held true through a lot of my life. But at the same time, it's like, man, I want to have fun. I want to enjoy myself and I want to be able to express myself in a way that that can be you know complementary to what I'm doing, but also have its unique kind of mark, you know. Yeah, for sure. So, what were some of the first sponsors that you got? Like, what what was that like? I, early, early on, um, I think I was down. Surf Expo is a big event they do yeah, every in year in Orlando, and it yeah. kind of features all of the water sport retailers, right? Whether it be sunglasses, whether it be shoe companies, whether it be you know, wakeboard manufacturers, boat manufacturers, whatever they, I would go down there and kind of stump for myself, right? Hey, I'm doing this. I'm starting to get a little press here and there, and I want to get somebody to support me in this endeavor. Um, I think it was the expo of 1994. Um, and I got a company by the name of Neptune, which was uh, an early, they made base. I think Neptune just made knee boards and then they got into making wake boards and they had a new twin tip design that had just come out on the heels of the kind of original, uh, wake tech was another company and they made a, a product called the flight 69. And it was kind of the original twin tip, although it wasn't a true twin tip, it was the first attempt and iteration at kind of that twin tip. I just remember those, uh, those Scott Byerly ads. Exactly. That's exactly. what he always rode. He rode that and he and Gator That's made right. those things absolutely famous. They actually in 94 won the world championships. They had two divisions in the worlds at that time. They allowed uh, a, an expression session, which was just a straight up free ride, big air, go for it competition. And then there was one where you had to kind of write down the maneuvers that you were going to do. And they had a point of a value associated with each one. Like and, a proper pass. Yeah, proper pass. And Scott won the, the proper pass or the, you know, kind of maneuver, written down maneuver competition. And Gator won the free ride competition. And 
they launched that company into orbit off of those performances. Well, and how many big companies were there? I remember, because, yeah, Neptune jogs my memory, obviously. Yep. There was like Wake Tech. Wake um, Tech, Hyperlight. O'Brien. Uh, O'Brien, exactly. Hyperlight, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. And O'Brien, I like Darren Shapiro was still riding that directional board. So or Darren, Darren like. started on HO Hyperlight. And then he transitioned to O'Brien later in the game, but his kind of original thing was Hyperlite. And they made, uh, after Eric Perez, who introduced me to the sport, he was, kind of had the first pro model in, in the mainstream board companies lineup. And then Darren got one shortly thereafter. And, um, and so that was was Darren's much more aggressive, and and I don't know if anyone remembers his riding style back then. And to this day, the guy is an absolute champion, and a badass, super intense. He's he's compact, he's muscly, he's strong as shit, and he just goes for it. So his his board was designed with that riding style in mind, and yeah. was just aggressive and fast. And so you were on Neptune to start. So I was on Neptune. They actually offered me the opportunity. It wasn't a money deal. It wasn't anything like that. But they offered me an opportunity. They said, "Hey, we have connected with a group of guys." Um, called fall line films they're snowboard filmmakers yeah. they've made some really badass legit films in the snowboard industry and they want to do a wakeboard film well we've got some slots for riders and we would like you to ride our new twin tip board called the neptune six um in this film and the film ended up um uh, being shot in lake lake powell in, in so is that hit it that was spray spray okay <clears throat> yep so the first i guess really it was shot on i guess it was 16 mil film cameras and we shot it over about a week's time on a houseboat out in lake powell in Nevada, i can only imagine Arizona. what those nights were like <laughs> <laughs> it, it was absolutely out of control it was it was so cool, and it was just this core group of us. I mean, it, it, you know, I guess at this point it's been considered one of the, you know, original and, and most, you know, well-done defining moments in wakeboarding film history. Um, and it was myself. It was Scott Byerly. It was Greg Nelson. It was Eric Schmaltz. It was Billy McCaffrey. It was, you know, just this core group of riders um, that went out there and kind of showcased both their talents and abilities. And obviously, the board manufacturers had something to gain by getting visibility in that. Right, but yeah. it was really just this kind of adventure trip, this, you know, kind of all about the passion, all about innovation, all about pushing the limits of things. I mean, you have Scott Byerly ollieing out of of rock natural rock pools over trash cans into the main part of the lake and eric schmaltz riding velcro booties and doing big old boneless one footers and just gnarly shit that was innovative and creative and just rooted in passion yeah. versus like competition results or trying to you know it's just like this fun camaraderie really rad setup I feel like a lot of these sports, be it skateboarding, surfing, um, wakeboarding, snowboarding, was it true like back then, like the video parts were all about being expressive and innovative, whereas like the competitions were just what paid the bills? Exactly. No, you couldn't be more right. I mean, it was really... So how many guys like didn't want to compete? A lot of us. I mean, we, you know, the guys that were pushing themselves and pushing the sport, you know, and there was kind of a, at, at one point, and I think the magazine coverage and all that hyped it up more than it was actually happening, but there was kind of this divisiveness between the water ski faction and the wakeboard faction, right? There was these well, guys. The skiers that, and the snowboarders. Correct. Exactly. It was absolutely that kind of rehashed for the water sports enthusiasts, right? Where, you had certain people that came from more of a water ski background and felt that competition needed to be regulated and, and, you know, points needed to be assigned to every maneuver and that's how it was. And then you had the guys that were like, man, I just want to go out and create. I want to create, I want to use land obstacles. I want to use docks and railings and, yeah, do and, slides and, it, and, yeah, and just yeah. do different shit that, that 
showcases creativity and the ability to to build off whatever's in my way yeah. versus just this kind of staunch competitive thing. So, you know, while, like you said, co the competition paid the bills, it, it also created to, if you did well in those competitions, to some degree, a lot of times you could appeal to your sponsors, hey man, I've done well in this, but I really want to travel. I really want to film. Right, I really right. Want... Gave you leverage. Exactly. Gave leverage to, to travel, to have those experiences and to, to kind of, I mean, it's almost, you know, it's outreach to the community and the fans and all that, man, let's go ride in these different spaces. They may not be perfect for wakeboarding or pulling off your best, most technical maneuvers, but they're damn fun and they get people fired up and they get people stoked and it just exposes more people to what's going on. And, and hopefully then, you know, for all intents and purposes, stokes the next generation of person to, to get out there on the water and, and try it themselves. Yeah, for sure. How, how big was the competition schedule? Like how many, how many comps were put on each year? So, I mean, or season, or there whatever. was, it, it kind of grew as, as the, as the sport did early on. Um, we were in, in conjunction with the, the water ski community that was a water ski and wakeboard tour um at a point in time the wakeboarders were getting all the tv time they were getting all the attention so that kind of broke off and it became a wakeboard only event but there were anywhere from eight to twelve national events in the u.s but then there were opportunity for us as riders there were tours in Japan, there were events in right. Europe, there were events in Australia as well. So for all intents and purposes, if you wanted to, you could kind of chase the summer and do a few contests in the US, do some contests in Europe, do some contests in Australia, and really just kind of round it out. And, and a lot of times your sponsors would be stoked on that and, and you know help, help support that kind of lifestyle, which was completely killer. So obviously on the video shoots, it was just mayhem at night. I'm sure sh probably shooting bottle rockets off at one another. Or there something were, crazy. yeah, there were all kinds of antics. There were all kinds of, uh, different substances ingested and people just creating. I mean, it was, you know, it was never anything dirty or gnarly about it. It was all this very like innocent discovery, pushing the limits, pushing creativity, pushing one another or inspiring one another, you know, pushing sounds almost competitive where it was one of these things where it was almost like a brotherhood where you were stoked for one another. When, when Byerly would go out and blow mines, you wouldn't be jealous of what he was doing. You would be stoked that he was wow. doing it. You'd be like, man, this is killer. Now I'm inspired to dream a little more, to, to try something a little outside of my comfort zone. I'm, you know, so, so it was that inspiration and those events and just those times spent together or sitting around at night, man, look under a, a starry sky out on Lake Powell or Lake Havasu or wherever it was and just talking about it, right? Oh man, I've been thinking about this or I've been thinking about that or, you know, what if we did this to, to change the technology in the boat or put more weight in it to make a bigger wake or so all these things, you know, spawned innovation and spawn creativity within these markets that, you know, we see all the way to this day of, of how the boats have changed and how the boards have changed. Oh, yeah, it's so funny. You're just jogging so many memories <laughs> out of me, just like the whole putting weight in the boat thing, like. We used to get buckets and fill them with water. We'd have like sandbags in the back of the boat to oh, make yeah. the wake bigger. Dude, absolutely. I mean, there were even companies that that were formed that that sold lead plates. Yeah, and, and like know, those were, bladders that you would just fill the up. Water with the water bladder, the yeah. fat sacks. The fat sack. Called, that's right. Right where you would fill them up oh with water. And, be, and basically, for all intents and purposes, I mean, I can remember Thomas Harrell, one of the legendary riders in the sport. Um, I mean, he was like, man, I'm not buying a fat sack and nobody would give him a fat sack. So he just went to a waterbed store and bought a waterbed mattress and threw that shit in his boat. And he's like, same, same, right? No big deal. Um, That's amazing. But yeah, so, it, you know, it all that stuff spawned innovation. And, you know, we were riding behind these boats and they had a, a pole, a ski pole, effectively, or a tow pole in the middle of the boat. Well, we were like, man, we need, we want to get higher. We want more, a, a higher pull. So 
they extended the pole. There was a, a thing the called tower. Uh, yeah, a Skylon or a, 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 there was a bunch of different names. I think the originator was the Skylon. And it was just a pole that, that sleeved over the original pole in the boat. But instead of being, you know, 40 inches tall, this thing was seven feet tall, right? And, and it had cables that ran to the front of the boat. And, but it gave you an upward lift. It, it allowed people to get bigger air. It allowed people to get up and out of the water. So learning to do the sport became easier. Time, time in the air was more so you could do a, a long, hold a grab longer. You could spin a little bit faster. You could do things that weren't previously being done. And that then kind of segued into doing the towers that you mentioned, right? That looked like a roll cage. If anybody's seen those on the boats, right? That's just, which a, is pretty much the only way they sell the boats. these Exactly. Days. Yeah. I mean, that is standard fare, not only on, you know, wake specific boats now, but you're seeing, you know, inboard outboards and kind of, uh, you know, family runabouts and stuff like that have these same design elements on them. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk a little bit about 95. Yeah, man. That was that was the big year, right? That was yeah, that was a good year for uh the contest scene for me, for sure. So so did anything change that year and for what we're referring to is you are the world champion that year. Yes. What changed at at all during did, that year? Anything? You know, the it, approach the honestly, it really no, it was just you know, on my game on point for that time that moment in time right it was like you know it's it's cliche but it's right place right time the vibe was good i mean i literally went into that event feeling terrible about how i was riding really um, myself thomas harrell kobe mikasich and and we we had been down in central florida training and riding and we were actually down at thomas's family's home in winter haven florida which is near cypress gardens and kind of all those historic water, water ski, ski spots. spots but we were out there every day pushing each other pushing ourselves kind of prepping and, and just training for this world championship event and i had been riding like hell like terribly all the way leading up to this so i went into it with this absolute, I just don't give a shit attitude, right? Just, uh, I'm going to go out there and something that Kobe and I always said to each other was just go bigger, go bigger, go bigger. We would crash and he and I would kind of coach each other. And I say that very loosely. It was just kind of a, you didn't go big enough. Yeah. You didn't go big <laughs> enough. If you go big enough, then you'll you'll have enough time to figure out what the hell you're doing wrong and then you'll be able to land on the boat right so it was just this kind of joking mantra but it was always go bigger go bigger hey man i just wiped out i'm halfway unconscious what i do wrong i don't know man go bigger <laughs> you know that was, that was just the that was the sentiment right and it and it paid off um in pushing i mean kobe was doing some of the biggest maneuvers out there biggest you know Mobius, which is, uh, you know, a backside roll with a full handle pass 360 in it. He was doing some of the gnarliest, biggest, most technical stuff, but it was because we were like, dude, dude, go bigger. Because if we go small, it's just, we're just going to get slapped down faster. And weren't you guys kind of two of the bigger guys on tour? We were like Kobe, from a stature, yeah, from standpoint. a stature standpoint. So Kobe, um, little over, I think he's like six one and you know, you know, a built dude, right? He was well, you know, in great shape, um, you know, just from riding every day, being on the water and all that. And myself, um, right at six feet. So we were some of the bigger dudes, you know, in the game for that. Most, you know, most of the guys, you know, Darren Shapiro is probably five, six ish. Um, Thomas, you know, five, nine, you know, just these guys are, are smaller statues, Sean Murray, you know, they're, it's a lot like snowboarding too. Correct. You know, a lot yeah. of those dudes are five ten. Yeah, having a smaller stature and having that that you know kind of ability to maneuver faster is certainly an advantage, right? Sure. So, so yeah, leading up to the whole ninety five World Championships, I was I was feeling pretty unprepared, unlucky, and not not ready to throw down and. You know, the day of the event came and we were up in Altamont Springs, which is the north side of Orlando. And I mean, it just things just started lining up, man. I mean, it was it's nothing more than I stood up my passes. I, I 
rode calmly and and just kind of didn't give a shit man i just let it all hang out and it was one of those things i always admired gator one of the writers i mentioned earlier that was one of scott byerly's friends and and partners at wake tech that that rode and and was just hell on the water man just went for it every time but the dude would go out in a contest and it would be he would either damn near win the thing or he would get a zero because he would crash on the first trick of both passes right he would just <laughs> just going it. for it just going for it going as big as he possibly could so i just kind of took that inspiration and that mantra and was like dude i'm gonna go as hard as i possibly can and whatever happens happens just caution in the wind yeah just let it rip and so it you know i did just that i didn't end up bailing or crashing and came back to the dock afterwards and you know was stoked that i'd stood up you know and landed the maneuvers that i wanted to but sure had no idea that that it would play out the way it did and kind of at the end of the event i ended up on top man no you know i was very much blown away i think you know, looking back at the funny YouTube videos and stuff of when I won the world championships and, and just looking at the thing, I, I was completely surprised. And I think I say stoked 40 or 50 times in my interview on ESPN. Probably just because you didn't know what else to say. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes, exactly. I didn't know what else to say. And damn it, I was stoked. I had won the world championships and yeah. certainly didn't count on it. And, and probably equal to or damn near better than that in retrospect was that I got first Kobe my my best friend writing partner daily guy that we grind it out with every you know behind the boat he got second Thomas Harrell same same board company full tilt wakeboards he got fifth man so we took one two and five in the worlds and it was just man it was so special for all of us to kind of it, it, you know it wasn't this singularly shared thing and i know i've talked about it being such an individual sport but dude it was just this vibe it and this felt like a energy. family it felt like a family man and we is that why it felt so good because i mean for a group of dudes that are recording expression centric sessions for 16 millimeter films <laughs> that don't give a shit about competing now it suddenly feels like a family is that why like it's looked back with like such fond memory yeah i i totally because like you so. didn't give a shit right well right i didn't give a shit but to to ha share that experience of success with your friends right to be able to share that with your friends it's more of that right winning is great but winning is fleeting yeah and we all know that and we've all had days where we feel like top of the world and the other the next day you feel like shit and whatever but but sharing that with with a community and with your friends and with the people that you actually care about and want to do well it's like nothing else man yeah and full tilt must have been stoked full tilt was super duper stoked they had just come out with my pro model and that had launched like a couple of months before and so you know everybody was kind of pushing to get visibility and all that and so then for kobe and myself and thomas to do so well that catapulted that little company into the limelight and they got so much press and it allowed us all to kind of do our own things we were all very different in our approach to the sport we we're very different in our approach to life but because of that moment in time it afforded us all to kind of do what we wanted to do in the, within the confines of the sport, right? We could travel, we could compete, we could do other things that, that influenced, you know, and, and work in helping marketing or doing the advertisements or doing crazy shit that, that, you know, was complimentary to, but not necessarily a writer's yeah. know, specific function. Well, I was going to ask you about it later because going from, I guess, Neptune to full tilt, like, what was that transition like? Like what it, what is it like as a pro athlete to change sponsors like that? I would imagine like in the NBA, they're going through like trade periods right now. Right. Is it kind of like getting traded or is it more like well, autonomous than that? I, th I think it's a little more autonomous than that, especially back then early on. And I think, you know, the, the, my deal with Neptune was so loosely done. Now they were awesome company. Um, they were, kind and generous and cool throughout the whole thing 
but I mean, I think I had a, a one page contract and it wasn't that well written. It wasn't that binding. It wasn't whatever. It was like, Hey, if you'll write our boards in this film, you know, we'll, we'll continue to we'll give continue you boards, to give you more boards. <laughs> yeah. We would like the press and you would like the opportunity. Right. So it was more, you know, not quite a handshake agreement, but right. when full tilt came, um, they were a small little upstart company out of Seattle area, Red, Redmond, Washington area. They came on the scene and approached myself. They approached Kobe. They uh, approached Andrea Gaetan. They approached Thomas. And, and we all kind of got on at different points in time. But, but they were just really wanting to, to have writer influence, writer influence expressed products things that that we had a, a passion for and wanted a direct hand in right kobe sure. knew exactly how he wanted his board design i knew exactly what kind of water channels i wanted and we didn't want an engineer doing it for us and telling us how it would work on the water we wanted to prototype these things we wanted to try them out we wanted to see how they would come off the wake how they would land what so like all rider feedback all rider feedback and and so that was really kind of Neptune had a product. They were kind enough to let me represent it and ride it and, and be a part of what they were doing, which was killer. But this just was a next step in, in allowing some real input, some real influence and, and some actual, you know, hands on opportunity at, at being kind of first line, you know, design work and graphic work and all that good stuff. That's rad. What uh, what kind of parallels were there in the snowboard industry? Like, I'm, I would imagine you guys at like, I don't know, were you guys a part of outdoor retailer or was that even a thing yet? Because it was Surf Expo in San Diego and in Orlando. I remember right. from back in the day. Right, and there there was there was a couple of different like action sports retailer and a couple of different shows, but we weren't that heavily involved with them. A lot of you know the. The apparel companies were involved with those, the sunglass companies, shoe companies, stuff like that. But from our perspective, our big kind of trade union show, whatever it was, was Surf Expo in Orlando. Well, and the only reason for that matter why I keep comparing it to snowboarding is because I subscribed both to Wakeboard Magazine and then I also subscribed to like Transworld Surf or excuse me, snow snowboarding and stuff. Sure. And I remember Transworld Snowboarding would always just... They did such a great job talking about the business aspect of the sport. So even from like my high school days, I just remember following who's on what team and <laughs> what binding sponsor is now sponsoring X rider or boot sponsor or goggles or whatever. Like I was for whatever reason, and I didn't even think about this really until recently that I always wanted to know what was going on behind the scenes for sure. And so I would read about contracts and stuff right, like that right. and how like certain riders were like, signing $300,000 a year, you know, deal. well, I, this is more in like the early 2000s. So right, we're probably right, right. five, seven years ahead of this. But sure. Was there any parallel like that in the wakeboarding side? Were you guys making just money hand over fist? I ever? mean, to some degree, not like that at, at the time that, that I'm kind of talking about this 90. Well, you guys were like the godfathers of the sport. Yeah. Right? We're the, we're the old guys. We're the early stage. I mean, honestly, if we want to throw it way back, you're, you're talking about the Eric Perez's, you know, the Eric Schmaltz, the Tommy Phillips on the, on the kind of organization side, the Jimmy Redman, the, you know, that, that started and founded WWA, the World Wakeboarding Association all these early stage folks, but we were that next kind of actually organized iteration of it. Now, were we able to support ourselves and have a hell of a lot of fun? Absolutely. Were we saving for retirement? Hell no. <laughs> so, and, and I don't even think that was, you know, part of our, our thought process or mantra. And it wasn't developed to the point like the snowboarding industry, right? Who, who had a, a good head start on on kind of the water industry or the wake industry for for specifics on their their business acumen right, right. so we were while well, snowboarding and trans world was covering hey this contract was offered by burton or whomever right take your pick of of you know kemper or whatever lib tech cool, or, whoever, lib yeah. tech or whomever at the time was was at the top of their game our companies were still trying to figure out what the hell was going on, right? Where we could make a, a really decent living to support 
a single person that was wanting to travel the world and stay on the water all the time and enjoy themselves and still have some spending money for sure. But, you know, I, I dare say anybody was making, you know, much over probably a hundred, 150 a year. Right. But as a single person traveling around where all your travel expenses are paid, somebody's flowing you clothing, somebody's flowing you sunglasses and oh, you're shoes. making double effectively. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so it was, you know, super- and then living in no tax, you know, Florida, yeah, exactly. right? No state income tax, Florida, or exactly. And pretty and lesser stack- expensive, North Carolina. No and- joke. And you're stacking people in the house, right? I mean, at any given time, we all would, would kind of consolidate and live together. It would be myself, Kobe, Thomas, Chris Bischoff, <laughs> his girlfriend at the time, you know, I mean, just, but, but we would pile in and that whole kind of vibe or that family feeling i mean we'd be on the water five six hours a day and then we'd be in and we'd make a meal and we'd go out and hit the clubs downtown and go it's a fraternity it's a stupid fraternity (laughs) of of just a lot of laughter a lot of fun minimal drama you know it's just kind of a good good vibe all around that's awesome and then you went to origin right yes how did origin come about so um at the time i guess Full Tilt had sold their, the, the guy that headed it up was a guy by the name of Bill Van Sickle, good businessman in the Seattle area. And he always put us in the driver's seat as riders. Well, as it got larger and more popular, they were approached by Ride Snowboards. And Ride Snowboards ended up purchasing um, our company, Full Tilt. And they started producing out of uh, their production facilities. And then Ride got purchased by K2, that conglomerate. So we got absorbed a couple of times through that, which got us further and further away from having any decision-making capacity. It gave us... Culture change, I'm sure. Huge culture change. And, And certainly, right, from a business perspective, I'm sure that was the right move from a... 22 or 23 or 24 year olds perspective that was bullshit and we didn't want to put up with it so at that point you know i i had recognized a little bit of success in the industry and and had a bit of a name that i could work with and linked up with some guys out of austin texas to create a a company called origin wakeboards and so you were part owner in that yeah i was part owner in that and and you know just had complete control of graphic design of board design of all that good stuff which was was cool man it was it was a good feeling but it was it was a short-lived thing it wasn't you know a lot of people you know the money side of things get into this thinking oh this is going to be a windfall it's going to be a a a lot of fun and and we're going to make money and right it's just not that way (laughs) once again this is water sports this is wakeboarding dude it's not you know, some multi-million dollar industry. It's a small niche market. So what was you guys differentiator? Like, how were you guys different than say Full Tilt, even after the acquisition or whatever? Man, I think it was just more innovative design, more testing, more ability to react quickly to market or or rider needs or whatever. And that, that really allowed us to to respond, hey, oh, we're we're wanting to the board to ride in this condition. We're wanting to do that. We can just change it quickly or make little nuancey changes. And they, the the guys that that held the purse strings weren't afraid to to switch it up. You know, they weren't afraid to spend some money to retool um, some presses. They weren't afraid. Whereas full tilt, once they kind of got in their lane and then they were acquired. The, the bigger companies didn't want to change up the designs. They didn't want to. Well, they're doing high volume at that, st- you know, at that point yeah. anyway. So yeah. like disrupting that would cost them money. Correct. Exactly. And, and you know, we just weren't down with that. We wanted to innovate. We wanted to push. We wanted to, to try new things and see how both it responded first and foremost on the water, but also in the market. You know, how is this received? How is this, you know, played out in the market space? So, right. It was fun. It was a great, you know, not a long lived company, but it was a really fun experience to be a part of and and work with some local artists, which actually ended up crossing paths with one of your other podcast guests, Clark, 
back uh, back in the day when he was with Artco, and I don't know if you knew anything about it, but well, I, yeah, I know all about Artco, but, but I I didn't know that he crossed over into the wakeboarding space. Well, so he was actually he was sharing a space with a guy by the name of Dean Sauls, and Dean was was a graphic artist, and I got his name through some mutual friends, and ended up going down and meeting with Dean in a space that he and Clark were sharing at the time. So I ended up meeting no Clark way. by default, right? And and now we're buddies and and know how much, you know, you guys love each other and what a special dude he is, but it was just this weird happenstance where he he kind of knew of what I was doing with the origin wake stuff and the graphic design stuff and all that and and I was familiar with Artco back in the day, but it was sure. It never quite kind of came to where we worked together, but we were always kind of in the same space on that that side of things. That's awesome. So what was sort of the demise of Origin then, if it were short-lived? Um, it was really they their numbers weren't like they wanted. They, they wanted to grow to be a Hyperlite. They wanted to be a Wake Tech. They wanted to be just from an investor standpoint. And that wasn't something we could deliver on. I mean, it just really wasn't something you know we could do really good numbers in mom and pop and niche market spaces where people were focused solely on wakeboarding but the industry at that time as you know as the economy waxes and wanes as we all know luxury goods and things like that take a back seat yeah they take a back seat so you know, a lot of these other companies were able to diversify and they had inflatables and they had knee boards and they had ropes and handles and they had all these other things. Well, we were like, no, dude, we don't want any of that shit. We're a board company and that's what. So, you know, standing by your convictions sometimes uh, creates the, the necessity to, to change it up in a really extro extreme or extraordinary way, which mean, you know, sometimes mean, hey, it's the demise of, of an era. Right. Right. So that's kind of the way that went. Is that so like what sort of got you thinking into leaving being a rider or was it just you were over it or was it were you injured or like what um man i you know it was one of those things where i i was splitting time between florida and north carolina and and i was you know i i didn't like the corporate side of it i loved the creative side i loved the marketing and advertising and design and pushing people's buttons and, and being rebellious and, and just kind of doing all that. But as you get older, obviously, it's a young person's sport, right? And, and your body breaks down and you get beat up. And, and knock on wood, I had been really fortunate to not suffer any real, you know, uh, ACL injuries or anything right. like that. I'd, you know, broken some silly bones and just stuff that that wasn't a major deal but but was relatively healthy and and could compete or do that but it just wasn't i it had changed for me um i i was dating a girl seriously i wanted to to kind of switch it up a bit right i knew that i didn't want to necessarily work for a boat manufacturer or work for a a wakeboard shop or do you know work work in that type of setting forever right that just wasn't my scene um when i la ended up kind of leaving that florida space and coming back to north carolina i all, always kept a wakeboard school and always would train people and i'd have you know groups come from japan or groups come from europe and they would stay with me and we would train and and that was fun man that was exciting and it was fun to to kind, kind of, of give back to give back spread the stoke teach people um and, and really just see how you could you know inspire or invest your time to to give them the tools to take it back to wherever they were from to sure to share that, to teach, to compete, to do whatever. Um, you know, that was a, a great time for me to learn about myself and learn, you know, hey, is this something that I want to do from here on out? Is this sustainable? Is this fulfilling for me? And, and you know, for what it was, it, it was great. And, you know, I had a lot of great experiences with the, the people that came through and stayed with me and trained with me and and all that but it it didn't you know for for a couple of reasons it just didn't really 
fulfill what I, I felt like I needed to, to keep doing. And I wanted to try some different things and try on some different hats and, and change it up a little bit. So what were some of the first jobs then? Well, at first, let's see. So, I mean, it's been a really funny ride kind of extricating myself from the water sports stuff and into the business I am now. And it came with a lot of weird one-off jobs, whether it be working at UPS, loading trucks. All oh, night. no way. Oh, dude. I didn't <laughs> yeah. know that. Oh, absolutely, man. I, uh, I worked for UPS loading a truck here in Raleigh that goes down to the coast of Wilmington, loading a tractor trailer. And I think I worked that from like, it was like the 11 PM to 4 AM shift for a while. Um, because like I said earlier, I had dropped out of high school and I was like, well, you know, to, to kind of do something different, whether it be in business. I mean, I felt like, you know, in the dealings that I had done and the contracts that you do for clothing companies or sunglasses or board companies or boat companies, I'd learned a bit about contract negotiation and self-promotion and all that. And I was like, okay, so if I want to do something business-wise, I need to at least have some sort of degree. So that's, I need to have that to show the piece of paper because some people just simply won't open the door if you don't have it, right? So I was like, all right, I need to go back to school. So I applied to NC State, North Carolina State University, right here, kind of in our backyard, and got accepted there. And so in order to do that, at this point, I was married and I had a son, Trey, who who we mentioned earlier, the third, <laughs> yeah. Michael the third, since the third. I'm the junior. And uh and so in order to put myself back through school, I guess, you know, as we had discussed earlier, we don't really save a lot in the wakeboarding world or there wasn't enough to save a lot for saving, retirement. Saving is not fun. No, it was not fun. It was not cool. And it damn sure wasn't thought about at that point. And I didn't have any real advisement other than my dad going, son, you should hang on to some of that money because it's not going to be around forever. Well, I didn't clearly right. listen to that. I was all, you know, just, I'll just make more. Yeah. It, thank you. Exactly. And, um, so during that time, you know, of going back to school and, you know, working towards, you know, a, a four year degree, I mean, I went straight through, but that meant also, you know, having a son at home, and, having, and how old are you at this point? At this point, I am 26 or 27. Wow. And um, so, you know, had was still into the wakeboard community, kept up with everything, would go to, to events for Malibu Boats, who was one of my sponsors. And I, I love those people to this day. They make an amazing product and are just just killer people, but would go and help them out at, at regional events or boat shows. And just because I love the industry, I, I, I it's never going to get out of me. Right. It's sure. a part of my DNA at this point. Yeah. hundred percent. And, um, and so at this point, you know, I'm going back to school, but I'm, I'm working nights at UPS and, you know, really it's a struggle, right? It's a struggle to pay bills. You're, you know, trying to, you know, raise a family or build a family or build something that's completely foreign to you, right? A, a new family. Holy shit. What is this? Right. I'm used to doing things for myself and about myself and traveling and, or with like in... six other guys and <laughs> exactly a bunch of beer on a houseboat. <clears throat> exactly. Excuse me. Um, and just, yeah, it being about kind of that crew or that family or that vibe like that, not that traditional, you know, two and a half kids, right. White picket fence, white picket fence jazz that, that, you know, but as someone that always shunned that and always kind of was, you know, walked away or ran away or talked shit about it at that point in my life, it was like, Oh man, I've been traveling. I've been doing, I've been, it'd be nice to have this stability. It'd be nice to have this kind of right same thing and you go out and do my job and come home and, be welcomed at the door and you know just this whole fantasy a sense of normalcy of, yeah this sense of consistency and normalcy because inconsistency was the only thing i knew which which was cool i chose it right i, I and i love it and i respect that that was a great time but 
It takes a different type of energy, though. It's a totally different type of energy, and it's something that, you know, really it's an it's a cool experience and and i'm so thankful for it and grateful for it and the time that i spent doing that i mean dude it was to the point where at some uh, you know time during this period i had to i had to go on public assistance i mean i had to literally we were so poor and so broke that i was like i need some help and i i didn't want to ask my parents for help Right. And I didn't want to go, you know, I'm working, you know, a job at night, all night. I'm going to school during the day and, you know, I got to have some relief here. And so for a bit of time, we, we got kind of on the, I guess, you know, for all intents and purposes, welfare and would, you know, I would go, my, my ex-wife would, would not go, uh, to the grocery store to use the little card the stamps or whatever. <laughs> yeah. At this point it was like, it's kind of a fancy debit card with an American flag on it, but she wouldn't even go like, she was clearly embarrassed by that. And right. You know, and it was, it was gnarly, man. It was a hard time. It was a real gut check. It was something that you're like, man, I hope I want this as bad as I think I do, because this is, you know, it's a, a hell of a departure from, you know, being flown around and be, people yeah. cheering for you and it's the antithesis. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, it was a grind. It was an experience and it was something, it was short lived for sure, but it was something that, that taught me a shit ton about myself and Hey, what do you want? What are you made of? Can you stomach this? And, and, you know, look around you. Who's really got your back? Who's really going to support you or care for you or be proud of you when you're down, when you're not in the limelight, when you're not getting magazine free coverage boats and, and magazine yeah. coverage and things like that. So it's uh, you know, it's a really cool learning time. I mean, I'm sure at the time I wasn't probably that stoked on it, but in retrospect, once again, it's one of those things where you're like, shit, man, I can. I can get in the dirt, man, and I'm not afraid to work and I'm not scared to to get busy and to dig in and and use the resources that that hopefully all of us have access to 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 help lift myself out of a situation that that was was not where I wanted to stay or Mm -hmm. remain, you know. And what so what got you out of that? So, I mean, honestly, it was, you know, utilizing that that help through the time where I was in school, I ended up graduating from my four-year degree in three years because I just did summer school and did the whole thing, right? I mean, just took the plunge. Go, Yeah, go as hard as you can and do as well as you can, as quickly as you can to yeah. get to the other side of it. Especially when you're not a fan to begin with. Yeah, yeah, when you're not. <laughs> like I mean, but it was really, it was work. really fascinating. I'm, I'm such a fan and so in support of, of now we hear of all these kids taking gap year programs and doing things between their high school and college careers to kind of figure out what they're made of. And, and it's really hit home of late. My girlfriend's son has done a gap year program and how old's Trey now? Trey is 17. So he's a senior in high school. My girlfriend's son Abbott is, he just graduated. He just turned 19 yesterday but he chose to, after graduating from Ravenscroft, he wanted to do a gap year program. He wants to teach and he got into this program that's insane, dude. It's like something that you and I would dream of. He started out in South Africa and was teaching surfing and surfing himself. And then he went from there to Ghana and he was helping build rooms onto a school there and helping teach. Then he came home for Christmas break, like any college student would do on their first year. He left, I think it was January 5th or something like that, went to Peru. He's in Peru now. Um, He's going to hike the Inca Trail, Machu Picchu. He's teaching English. So when Um, he's teaching all these different places or building these rooms, he's getting paid for this? No, no, no. They're just housing him and feeding him as a result. You have a host family. Nice. And and so and then he goes from there to to Nepal 
and he's in Nepal for a month, and then he finishes up in Thailand and gets scuba certified. Dude, I hope he's keeping the same <laughs> airline, at least to rack up the same points. You <laughs> right? know what I'm saying? I mean, it's the most insane. But but I, I protract that out because it's such a thing that I'm like, man, the experience that he's getting and the things that he's learning about himself. And other cultures. And other cultures and other people and how they live in that, hey, man, we've got it really, really sweet here. But there's so many other facets to life and so many other facets to the way people do things and live and interpret one another and, and treat one another. Right. Absolutely. It's just such a cool thing. You know, I, I bring that up because, man, it was one of these transition periods in my life where I had to learn what the hell I was made of. Now, I wasn't getting to travel like he is currently. I had done a lot of that in the past on someone else's dime, right. you know, via these great sponsors I had and whatever, but it was a time to grow and learn and learn about myself and learn that, Hey man, I'm not so different. If I'm, you know, this guy that was once, you know, relatively successful in the sport that he loved and still loves, but I have to go on public assistance to get through a rough spot in my life. I'm not very different than anybody else that does that right i mean i think sure. we think of each our, ourselves and each other and we have these perceptions about each other but when you break some of that down and go through some of these more kind of gut wrenching or gut check experiences you go oh shit, man me and this other person who i would never maybe identify with aren't very different we're really similar and i can identify with them and i can learn from them and i can so it's like this really cool like status is such a messed up concept <laughs> it is it's insane it really is just i know that's a pretty sweeping statement but it's it's crazy yeah no. I, don't, I don't even know how else to describe it no i i get it and, and the similarities that we have with those that we think we're so dissimilar from, or better than or, or better than lesser than or, or, or smarter than or faster than right. or prettier than or the similarities become so minuscule and so blurred and so ridiculous and and it all it takes you know and, and shit i know we're all over the place on our conversation but it's like that's what these things are about man <laughs> dude it's like but it's like you and i having a conversation sitting down across from one another i you know i I know people get fired up about so many different things and whether it be politics or religion or all just whatever, right? Sure. Colors on paint or whatever the hell it is, art and interpretation of that or whatever. But when you sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and look someone in the eyes and speak your truth and then spend the time listening to them and, and receiving what they're saying, you, you learn that, those differences are, are palatable. Those differences can be overcome and understood or at least heard out. And they don't, you know, we don't just go on a rant on Facebook or on some social media, Twitter platform or whatever, where you're, you know, oh, you're not hearing the other side or really listening or sitting across from the person understanding it. So, right. you know, we... It came up recently, I think in the previous podcast, actually, um, just the human connection just in general, right? right. Like how social media, albeit created to facilitate the human connection, has borderline done the opposite and has like <laughs> Dude. created people with absolutely zero interpersonal social skills and how like relating to one another, speaking to one another. And honestly, and so I said to the last guest, it was, you know, that's why I want, that's part of the reason I wanted to do a podcast is because not only do you and I sit here today having a human connection, sure. but I think the listener also, I think that's why podcasts are, are they've become popular because for every, you know, misstep in a human connection that you have on your daily life, like a podcast in a, I mean, maybe this is self-serving, but like, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it kind of brings you back to feeling as though you're at least in the room with us, right? Like Absolutely. drink your beer, drink your coffee, have that shot of tequila if you want. Whatever right. you're doing at Be home, listening. Be comfortable. Thank you for listening, but Absolutely. I'm glad you're here during the conversation with well, us. Well, and sharing that with us, right? Yeah. I mean, I hope that, that you know, through, and I know, you know, in listening to your other episodes, that connection is real and you get drawn in. You get drawn sure. into the story. You get drawn into 
the passion, the excitement, the, the angst, the frustration, the whatever it is sure. draws you in and it engages you and it makes you think how that relates to what you're dealing with, right? Because you know, what did I read just recently? Something just saying, you know, hey man, we all, we all look so pretty in these social media settings and whatever, but man, we're all like, you know, one foot in the ditch, one foot, which is cool. I mean, I, I get that, but I identify with that too. You know, yeah. it's, it's such a, it's such a true statement and, and it's good to connect over these conversations. It's good to talk. It's good to kind of get this out of our systems. Right. Yeah. And, and no, hundred percent share it with everybody else. I was actually talking to my mom this morning just about how like so much of social media is, and I'm stating the obvious here, but it's nothing but the highlight reel, you know, For sure. like For you, sure. you never see the dark stuff. And if you do, how many people are reading that going, Oh God, here we go again. <laughs> right. Do you know what I mean? Are they going to ask me to share that, that? Are they going to? Yeah. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, oh, repost man. this, please. Damn it. And it's like, you know, you got to take the good with the bad and the bad with the good. And sure. you obviously were on assistance Absolutely. just to sort of wrap it back into the, no, <laughs> the no, conversation. No, I, but like, you know, I never knew that about you. Yeah. And uh, I think it's, it's not something that I've shared or have been, you know, at the time it was something I was, I felt really bad about. I felt embarrassed about. Well, it's a complete ego check, oh, right? God, is it ever. And, and, you know, over time and through, you know, the, the thoughtfulness and care of many others and the love of, of people and a, a girlfriend that is inspirational and thoughtful and emboldens me to share more of myself with whomever. It's like, man, this is, you know, this is something that actually it's real helped me. It's real. And it's helped me be more me. Right. And admitting to that, which while it feels like a failure on many levels, it feels like, man, it's okay. Sure. It does. It doesn't change at my core who I am. It, it just, I'm being honest with people. I'm being honest with myself for God's right. sake. Right. Are you a watch collector, but having trouble finding something cool and unique? I mean, the last thing you really want is what everyone else has, right? Well, this is where my friend and former Standard Age podcast guest, Tim Jackson, comes in. He and his wife, Jana, own Passion Fine Jewelry in Solana Beach, California, where you'll find an incredible assortment of independent watches waiting for you in their shop and online. And if you're getting engaged, have an anniversary coming up, or simply have another reason to buy jewelry, they have you covered. Passion Fine Jewelry also employs a goldsmith on staff for any custom desires, so you're able to go that route if you so choose. Visit Passion Fine Jewelry when you find yourself in Southern California, but they're also open 24 hours a day at passionfinejewelry.com. You can also find a wealth of information through Tim's blog, independentintime.com, where he covers anything independent watchmaking related, uh, among a plethora of other information, so check that out as well. I've really enjoyed creating these podcasts on behalf of Standard H and sharing each of these personal stories with all of you. We each have goals, and it's the entrepreneurial spirit that inspired me to start the company. You can further support the brand and the podcast by visiting standard-h.com to pick up your choice of merchandise. And as always, thank you for listening. Lastly, if you have a moment, please rate and review the show. It makes a tremendous difference in keeping these things going. Now back to my conversation with Mike. Going from assistance then, what was what was the gig that sort of took you off assistance, if you so, will? So, yeah, no, for sure. Um, so, as you well know, um, Stephen Smith, one of your great friends and mine. Known him since second grade. Super amazing <laughs> dude. Um, and, and, you know, he... he and you, we would we would go out and we would wakeboard, and I would come over to Stephen's family house and cottage on Lake Gaston, and his father Randy and mom Beth would always be around, and his sisters would be out and about. But I always noticed that, excuse me, his his father Randy, super laid back dude, but he always had really nice toys, right? He always had a. <laughs> new Malibu boat in the lift. He always had a shiny, badass five series BMW in the driveway. He always, <laughs> and, and obviously, you know, not to 
harp on those material things, and, and, but he had his shit together, right? He, he was not flashy, but he was professional. He was demure. He was kind and thoughtful, but he was going places, right? And that was something that was really fascinating to me. I didn't know what the hell this dude did, and I didn't know what the scene was, but I wanted to know more. And, you know, obviously through, you know, wakeboarding with you guys and doing lessons and getting out on the water, I got to know Steven and his family better. And I guess at, when I was ready to make that transition, when I was getting ready to finish up my, my college career at NC State, I reached out to Randy Smith and, and asked to have a coffee with him, you know, and, and, I actually think I, if I remember correctly, and look, I've had so many damn concussions. My my <laughs> memories are are <laughs> faded, weak, and and fractured at best. But I think I went to Beth Smith, his wife, uh, Stephen's mom, and asked to to talk, you know catch up with him, have a coffee, whatever. He um, then Beth responded and said, "Hey, you know this is weird. Randy gets asked if if." you know, for, for help or for, you know, insight as to what he does all the time, but he never really responds to it. Right. He's very busy. He's doing, I still don't know what the hell this guy does. Right. I'm like, man, what is, what kind of secret agent shit? Is right. I was going to say into, this guy's like man? MI6 or something. Like <laughs> right. He's like this super chill laid back dude, you know, low key, but, but fuck, he's doing something right. And, um, so Thankfully and fortunately, he agreed to meet with me over a coffee, and I'm sure it is certainly just out of thanks for, for, you know, working with his kids on wakeboarding and spending hours over there and all that, whatever the synergy was, or if he thought maybe that I had a bit of a brain left after, you know, racking it a million times in, in the water, we, we caught up and I found out that he was working for a company called Stryker and doing medical device sales, knees and hips and trauma and stuff like that. And, and at this time, as you know, as we were saying, I was finishing up my college career and kind of as plan B, it was, hey, I'm going to go to law school. My dad's an attorney. My sister's an attorney. I know what that's like. I know the feel of it. I know the vibe, but it's not very interesting to me, man. It seems kind of like a coffin, but, but maybe, and look, no offense to all you dynamic lawyers out there. You know, I know you guys do your thing and love it, but, but damn, you know, for this, this guy, maybe not so much. And, and I'm sure your profession will be thankful that I didn't enter it, <laughs> but, um, but I met with him he, and he told me about what he did. And he said, you know, I can't give you a job. I work for this monster company called Stryker. I can certainly introduce you to the, the local bosses and maybe they'll allow you an interview. And, you know, hey, man, that's super appreciated. Uh, appreciated. That's all I could ever ask for, right? If you could make the intro, I get it. It's up to me. I've got to put in the work. I've got to show up and, and impress these dudes enough to, to get an interview. Sure. And so that, that allowed me the, the opportunity to meet with kind of the, the folks on the ground at the North Carolina branch of, of Stryker and um, ended up, you go through this whole interview process. It's, you know, with some sort of, interview national interview company and then they grade you and they rate you and they they do all this this stuff to uh to kind of make sure you fit their striker mold right and and you know at the time i'm i've cut my hair so i look semi respectable and and employable and um and so i go through their their um, you know the the screening process and all that which took i don't know it probably took 6 months to I was get gonna through. say it's a lengthy process it was a lengthy process and and at the end of said time they offered me a position as kind of basically a gopher again right so i find myself in this gopher role you know i'd been eric perez's wakeboarding gopher back in the day but now i was going to be randy smith's gopher trainee slash underling so you're like um, a sub rep, I so, guess. Yeah, I would sub call it. rep, um, associate rep, whatever. I don't know kind of what the, the terminology is for it now. 
but that was just a huge, huge, you know, blessing. I'm super grateful for it because it was just such a cool opportunity. And, and I didn't realize the synergies to my old, I mean, obviously if I've been in wakeboarding and I've been doing these kind of, you know, uh, high risk, high reward maneuvers and stuff, I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie, right? Let's just call it what it is. I didn't realize the synergies or the adrenaline junkie crossover from wakeboarding to like the to, sales perspective, to the sales and especially the, the orthopedic sales stuff where you're, you're going into trauma, you're going into trauma surgeries, you're basically the technical support for the surgeon as they're putting a shattered femur back together or a shattered pelvis or putting a new knee or hip in someone. And obviously, I, you know, I fast forward the conversation because the, the training is massively comprehensive and you spend weeks and weeks and then months and then years in, in training and learning about the, the products and all of the dimensions and the angles and the blah, 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 right? The list goes on. But the excitement that you get when you're on call to support these physicians that are actually doing, you know, they're doing the real stuff, the heavy lifting, the heavy lifting, but being a support scenario or a support representative for these things is wildly uh, satisfying for an adrenaline junkie, right? Because <laughs> sure. you're, it's 2 a.m. You're getting called into a, a major, you know, car wreck and they're putting somebody's leg back together or their ankle or their arm or their whatever and you're you're up and you've got to be on so I, I didn't realize until i was in it i thought it was cool i thought it was hey this is going to be exciting this is you know different every day there's a lot of variety to it i'm learning more than i've ever learned before and it will be wild but but until you're in it you don't realize just how intense it is or how it can satisfy that need to to have kind of an adrenaline rush when you're used to getting it from behind the boat or doing something completely unrelated. Sure. Yeah. So how long did you do that with Randy? So I did that with Randy. I believe it was from Oh six until about Oh eight. Okay. So um, two years. So two years. Is that um, how you met your partner? So my Matt? business partner, Matt Buckley and I met, he was also a sub rep for Randy and that's how baller Randy was. Dude, Randy was super he had, ba he needed baller. He two sub reps. <laughs> super baller, super. He's still baller. The dude just doesn't miss, man. And um, he, he, so he, Matt started. I know uh, he's going to listen to this. Randy will. Right, right, I'm right. sure. I know Beth will, but probably Randy too. <laughs> I sat down with a conversation with Randy over coffee once. Cause I was in orthopedic sales for a, right. a blip on the radar. Okay. Uh, just for a distributorship. Anyway, this conversation clearly isn't about me, but the parallel was when I sat down with him and I will never say this to his face, which is why I can say it <laughs> into this microphone. I was just so intimidated by him. Oh my God, dude. Like he taught me so much from like, he taught me so much because I spent right. so much time with him, right? Yeah. And that Malibu boat on the lift was wiped down by yours truly Damn after every right. single run. I, I <laughs> he, know that. Stephen yeah. and I had rags out taking the water spots off that Malibu boat. Absolutely. And uh, But anyway, I just... Well, I that, know what that experience is like sitting down talking to him. Dude, it is the... He's the nicest guy, but I was so intimidated by him. Nicest guy. He is so smart. And, and so thoughtful about what he did and was so good at what he did. There was, there was no hope that Matt or I ever would equal his relationship building skills, his technical acumen. His, I mean, and he's a PA. Dude, he, he he's a, a PA. PA yes. Yeah. The dude is brilliant and he's so talented, but he trained us so unbelievably well. And he was, he was one of these teachers. It was more of the Mr. Miyagi thing where you're doing repetitive shit over and over again. And not understand. And you don't the understand value. what the hell is going yeah. on. And then he steps out of the operating room and a surgeon looks at you and goes, What, you know, 
what size correlates to what I've just done you in start, your product. You start painting fences. <laughs> and you're like, and but but you react and you learn, you know, you learn how to react through those things. You didn't even see it coming. And but but when it's go time, when when your time to shine happens, you're so well prepared and you're so ready. And he would set up things like that all the time. And it was just this excellent foundation of training, this excellent foundation of of thoughtfulness and honesty. And, you know, it was it was a whole thing as you know, as Randy is to you, he was he was very much a father figure and inspiration and someone that taught me all about how to behave in those atmospheres, how to react, how you know what not to do, right? If you don't know, say you don't know. Be honest, but damn it, go find out, right? Like, when especially in a high consequence scenario. Of you course, know? of course, right? Who are we there to serve? We're there to serve the patient first, and then we're there to serve the the physician and their operating room, right? And what's going on for the best, most efficient outcome for the patient. So, very different, but very specific to a high pressure, high performance, and a really cool outcome if you do what you're supposed to do. If you perform in the way you've been trained, yeah. just like in wakeboarding or snowboarding or surfing or any of these other things, if you do what you've been trained to do and you've trained yourself to do and you've taken some of that onus on yourself and had excellent teachers, you're going to kick ass. You're going to perform. You're going to... so. To the long ago question of how did you get off of the public assistance and all that, it was, you know, through this opportunity of getting interviewed by Stryker, of the opportunity of getting offered a position as a sub rep or an associate rep for Randy. And that ultimately led to me meeting my current business partner, Matt Buckley. And after a couple of years, Matt and I got the opportunity to leave and go to a small company that just did biologic solutions for spinal fusion and bleeding control. So out of the knees and hips and orthopedic prosthetic game into something that was a little more hardcore science related, right? Cell seeding and blood flow and oxygen flow and how to grow bone in a weird space, like really, really trippy kind of sciencey stuff. And we jumped at the opportunity to take that on ourselves and, and work for a small upstart company. Um, they, so we left Stryker, which I don't think they appreciated very much. Stryker likes to keep their people in their ranks for the long haul. And as a testament to them, they've taken care of a lot of people for a long time and, and make, made extraordinary lives for them. Matt and I, once again, you know, being outliers, being a bit rebellious, not following the status quo, this little company was more of a sexy fit for us, more of a, a freedom to do and, and be ourselves, but use those foundational things. We could never, ever, ever be where we are today or have started what we had done had we not learned from Randy how to conduct ourselves, ourselves keep our composure or our wits about us in these situations. So, you know, it all led to that where we have now, you know, been kind of a biologics only for neurosurgical spine and orthopedic spine and some orthopedic products um, in bone regeneration, bleeding control, neonatal stem cell therapies for, for the last, what, decade, over a decade now? So you guys basically just left Stryker to sell a different product to the same physicians? To some of the same physicians, but we actually ended up having to retool it because we were working in kind of that orthopedic knees and hips and things like that. They use some bone graft and, and some of these products in that space, but these smaller companies we found out that, you know, just by being a part of these things that they they're sold more in the spine market. So that was something I didn't have any relationships in. Matt didn't have any relationships in. And, you know, I was I was leaving Stryker, who was then offering me a territory of my own or was wanting to keep me on and increase my salary and do all these things. I was jumping ship to go join my buddy Matt at something 
where there was no guarantees, there was no anything with a young upstart company. So now and are I you didn't still have, there? Well, you guys now have so, your own thing, right? We have our own thing. So fun, you know, ironically, I jump ship about six months after Matt from Stryker and we go to this small company worth of Vita. We within about, I don't know, it's probably six to eight months started really hitting our stride. Matt, Matt really started hitting before me. I had to really branch out and learn a lot of stuff. Um, I ended up working in the OBGYN space, in the urology space, and all these different spaces in, in open heart and lung and different things like that while I was trying to get in front of these spine surgeons. Spine surgeons, I mean, just to, to kind of put it out there to everybody, it's, it's kind of like a, a you know, NBA player where there's, there's not that many of them and they do such a specialized thing that they're very hard to get to. And once they've kind of got their own routine, they don't deviate from that a lot. Right. So it's one of these things where it's, it's very hard to get in with them and it takes time, but it was something that we were committed to do. Um, Matt and I work really well together. We feed off of each other. We're both, you know, fun, loving, you know, love to travel, love to have fun at the end of the day, but we're very serious about what we're doing and how we do it. But we also want to bring value to it, right? We, we with this Worth of Vita company, we built it up over about two years alongside the parent company of Worth of Vita, um, just as, as employees for the company until about 2010. In 2010, we decided to do our own thing and go distributor with the company. Now that just means we would still be selling the exact same things, but we wouldn't be W2 employees. We would take the risk on ourselves, believe in ourselves, make a better revenue or commission, but we wouldn't have any of the safety net of a retirement plan, a guaranteed salary benefits, benefits, any of that stuff. So once again, you know, kind of jumping off a cliff into an unknown, but it just felt like a good thing to do. It's like, Hey, you know, what the hell, why not? Let's, let's try this out and see what happens. That always seems like the upside was, would far outweigh the downside. It does. Or you could always find another job. Correct. You, you feel that way, but, but in the moment, you know, when you have a wife and you have kids, two kids at that point, people, two kids at that point, you get a lot of heat from the homestead. Like, why are you going to shake the trees? What's wrong right. with you? Why don't, why aren't you happy or satisfied with what's going on now? And you know, why do you think that is? Man, I'm never satisfied. I mean, I, I, I love change, although it freaks me out all the time. I love the excitement of change. I love the excitement of opportunities and new things. And that's been a hard lesson learned over a long time of, of how to, you know, just really receive the change and, and, and work with it and, and use it to the benefit, right. And use it to, to grow and experience things. And, and it's something that I'm working with my kids on now, right. They've, they've been, you know, very sheltered for all intents and purposes and had this calm, mellow thing they've seen me in lots of different iterations of myself but damn sure. you know it's it's something that you've got to be willing to take on and feel a little nervous about and feel a little bit of fear because that's really what kind of ups that game yeah i mean going back to the adrenaline right like correct it creates that for you i mean i've for a long time i've lived by the always be happy but never be satisfied right that's that dude you couldn't say it better right it's it's really and I've, you know, and I have a hard time delineating those sometimes, right? I'll get frustrated and down and, oh, damn it, I did I choose wrong? And it's not or... a material thing. Right. You know, right, it's right. not like, I mean, granted, you know, my love for watches. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not uh, that. Like, right. It, it's, it's a life thing. It's not a stuff thing. Yeah. It's, it is. And it's that experience and, and you know, the, the hopeful ability to now, you know, as I learn to communicate better and I work on myself and my ability to listen better and receive better, you know, to be able to pass that on or to share that with somebody and hope that someone gets, you know, a minuscule amount of, of hopefully what I'm 
sharing or hopefully sharing and then hearing that response and being able to listen to if that resonates or if it doesn't and, and try and, you know, it's, it's almost a teaching role, right? Where, oh, absolutely. Where you kind of get into these spaces, but, um, it's, it's a fun thing to, to put yourself into these weird and, and uncomfortable spaces. And to get back to what we were talking about after about two years, when we, after we went as a distributor rather than a direct employee, about three months after doing that, the company worth of Vita was bought by Stryker. No way. No way. So <laughs> had we not pulled the trigger to go distributor at, at a time, a few months prior to that, we would have been Stryker employees again. So let's rewind to that jump off point then yeah. to become a distributor. And we don't have to go into specifics, sure. but what was what was the startup like did it take investment on your part or were you guys just foot in the door already and all you need to do is sign a few pieces of correct paper? exactly so it there was, was no like monetary investment like you and matt didn't have to come together for half a mil or whatever correct because we already had that stream of business going on i think from the parent company viewpoint it's like hey you don't want to lose the business well yeah if these guys go independent we save all this money that that we've already allocated right for salaries for benefits for you know all of the things that you know so i don't know what that number comes to on a business side but let's just it's say it's expensive though 100 grand whatever it is right that saves them that and they all they have to pay on is the work that we perform right now so if if i sell something then i get paid on it if i sell nothing they're out nothing right? right so it's really a value play i think for both the company and it's a it's a riskier proposition for the distributor but the rewards are higher right because if they're not paying you anything on the on the kind of front end they can pay you more on a commission standpoint right yeah. so that's that's kind of the balance that you play right to, to weigh that out and if you believe in yourself if you believe in your team um you just go for it so how many employees are there now well so now we've it, it has changed once again it ebbs and flows over time and it depends on the technologies that we're working with at one point in time in around 2012 2013 um, we got into some technologies that allowed us to swell our our 1099 independent contractor network to about a hundred people. Oh, wow. And it was huge and it was insane. And we brought on a third partner who was one of our close friends and just a super brilliant dude, um, who has now since gone on to another company that we also distribute for, but he, we brought him in. He was, he was, he's a brilliant, uh, biomedical engineer and understands the landscape of that and just helped us kind of flesh out and manage this larger scale operation. But then again, over time, the, some of those things dry up, right? We, we work in a really special niche market where these companies that we distribute for generally do anywhere from, I don't know, 10 to a hundred million dollars in business annually. And, after they hit that critical point, Stryker buys them, Medtronic buys them, some other Globus, one of these big spine companies ends up buying them and then we lose rights to it. So then we're back to square one. So we're always on the lookout for what's next, what's coming through the approval process with the FDA, what's new, what shows promise, what has the most data driven. Now, where do you results. get that data from? You can, Honestly, I scour the FDA submission uh, websites and I'm on, I'm reading studies and reading like, you know, pre FD approval studies and cellular development studies and, and doing all that stuff constantly. I'm voracious reader about that. And I, I just get into the science. I totally nerd out on it and totally get into it and think it's fascinating. And then I come back and I tell my kids and my girlfriend all about it and they just zone out and can't stop right. <laughs> or their minds explode or their Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's just one or the this other. really. Yeah. So, <clears throat> but there's, it, it's been really fun to, you know, it keeps me on my toes. It keeps you kind of in front of what's going on in that sector. I'll be at a very narrow, a very niche 
segment of, of what's going on. But it's also led to some really interesting other discoveries, right? I mean, I was, I was studying the effects of CBD on, on uh, tumor, uh, tumor uh, growth and, and how, to, how that's mitigated some of that back in like 2012. I'm reading about CBD and how it does that. And this was, you know, obviously we live in a, in a time now where, you know, our good friend Stephen Smith has, you know, owned a wellness and has these, these amazing CBD products. And there's all these different products on the market that are touting the benefits of different things, but there's a whole science side to it, right? I mean, I know we get a lot of our information on healthcare from snippets on Twitter or what's the latest advertisement that pops up in our news feed or whatever, but there's some really radical, really cool deep diving studies talking about how, you know, how that, you know, the, you know, one one part of the the hemp plant affects this type of malady and how it affects it in the body and how it works on tumor genesis and you know just some different really cool stuff man so so just being a reader and being into what i'm doing has taken me down all these multiple pathways that allow me to explore things on the side that that hopefully give me you know a thoughtfulness and and you know, whether it be an edge to my business or just a more well-rounded, you know, thoughtfulness about the human condition. Would you say that the only thing standing in the way of being a pro athlete or an entrepreneur for that matter is mindset? I would think completely. I mean, obviously there, there are, you know, physical hurdles and, and different things, but, but I think all things considered, if you can see it and if you believe it and if you keep pushing I, I've seen so many times and even in the business that I'm currently in with with medical device or or biologics or anything like that the time spent in it and the t time you commit to it is paramount to the level of success you achieve right if you're passionate about it and you get into it and you dig in you pick your head up and it's five years later and you're like damn you know this is still fascinating this still turns me on or i've seen another you know lineage or or angle that i want to follow and you chase that down but it's that commitment to it and that excitement for it or that passion for it that if you have it and you believe it's almost not even going yes i can do that it's just uh i'm so into this i can't help myself right right um and i think that's indicative of of so many people entrepreneurial you know, endeavors or athletics or whatever. It's like, I'm just so damn into this. I can't stop myself. So I'm, I'm going to just get in deeper. I'm going to keep digging. I'm going to keep being passionate about it. And I think it's an authenticity thing, right? You're sure. not doing it to impress someone else. You're not doing it for an end game of monetary return. You're just doing it because you dig it, man. Right. Yeah. So what are you doing these days outside of work? Are you still riding? I'm still riding. So now it's been really, really cool, man. So as of lately, I've really re-engaged with the wakeboarding scene through the Wakeboarding Hall of Fame. Yeah, um, I was, I was going to ask you about that. So yeah, so I, um, Tommy Phillips, um, who I mentioned earlier, one of the early pioneers in organizing the world championships and, and different contests and things early, early on in the game in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, founded the wakeboarding hall of fame in order to honor and preserve what the the history of the sport right the innovations the things that had happened from the earliest times in the sport to current to current place so they asked for for my help on the board of that a couple years ago and then um elected me as president of the hall of fame i guess it's been two years ago now and so i spend so much of my downtime working on that, working on inductions. Every year we induct at the uh, Surf Expo that we've mentioned before. We induct, it, there's no set number, but it generally plays out to be four to six new athletes, innovators, lifetime achievers into the Hall of Fame. And we're working, you know, on our social media awareness. We don't have a physical location currently. It's all digital. Um but we're working towards having a brick and mortar place at some point where we can really showcase, uh, you know, 
the board yeah the evolution the evolution of what's going on exactly um and we've recently a friend of mine locally has offered some some space he's got a warehouse and a place where he's just a big wakeboard collector anyway interesting and he's like dude if prior to having this brick and mortar you know hall of fame wakeboarding hall of fame i would love to help you guys house all this historic material whether it be boards or different devices or whatever and and also you know just preserve these things and catalog them for you guys so that's really got some really cool things going on going on right now and we're actually at the end of this month um there is a big wsia which is the water sports industry association they have a big event up in Tahoe called the Snow Summit, and um, we are actually going to be presenting up there. When is that? And that is the 24th and 5th or 5th and 6th. I'm sorry, guys. I'm blanking on it right now. But it is at the end of this month up in Tahoe. And um, so we'll have a big, you know, they'll have a meeting about the water sports industry in general. Go, you know, have basic, you know, events on you know talks on what's going on in the industry the health of the industry where it's headed trends blah 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 we're able to and have been honored with um the president of the wsia kevin michael has been kind enough to offer us time at the evening presentation at the end you know closing ceremony so to speak to have some time to induct a few of our 2019 riders into the hall of fame um our 2019 event got canceled because of the hurricane oh, right. this past uh, September in Orlando. So it, it totally put the kibosh on the whole 2019 class. We will be inducting them all in 2020 at Expo, but we have this great opportunity through the WSIA that's been so cool and supportive of us to allow us to present and induct a few up there. So some uh, we've got Thomas Harrell, who's living on the West Coast now, and he's going to come up and be inducted there in front of the industry and just some really cool stuff because some of the guys from the west coast it's hard to get them out you know everybody's got you know real jobs now or family or family and... obligations and it, it's hard right that we're a, a 501c3 company so we're we work off donations only it's a nonprofit. it's just what it is and so you know you work on a shoestring budget you try and get more people involved you try and get more industry support which the industry has been wildly supportive of and i think this wsia event will help you know put it over the top in terms of them knowing what we're about and that it is the true history of our sport it's done by people that were there it's not you know somebody going oh i think i remember this or i'm searching it on the internet and whatever it's you know done by the guys that were there the women that were there the people that helped forge, you know, these, these strange paths to where the sport is now. Yeah. That's incredible, man. That sounds super exciting. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's takes up a good bit of time outside of kind of the regular daily workload and, and, you know, hanging out with my kids and, and, you know, being proud of them for whatever they're doing right now, whether it's lacrosse or whether it's basketball or whether it's football or, whatever that may be. Um, and then just trying to get a lot of surfing in, honestly, I've been traveling a bunch. Uh, my girlfriend and I try and go pretty regularly out somewhere. I mean, we've been to some pretty killer places recently. Um, we're in Morocco down in Southern Morocco surfing about a year and a half ago. And we've been, you know, done Puerto Rico. It's an easy, you know, trip from here for us and then go down to Puerto Escondido quite often and spend some time down there and surf and and so just have some stuff. And then, you know, I always try and look for opportunities to, while I'm on these kind of fun trips and whatever, but ways to integrate what I know or what, what I'm doing currently into those spaces. So I'm looking at, you know, hopefully trying to do some work internationally and do some things where I can support surgeons or physicians out of the country and like the doctors without borders thing. Yeah. Things, you know, things like that, where they're doing surgery, where they're utilizing technology to help their patients. If there's opportunities 
to to you know do some things you know kind of as i travel and as we we adventure a bit to to kind of help support that game uh, would be awesome. a terrible thing yeah well dude i can't thank you enough for for joining the podcast and catching up man this has been super fun dude absolutely i couldn't appreciate it more it's so good to see you man it's absolutely. good to relive some of this stuff and you know, it helps my, my rattled brain uh, get back in gear, man. After all these concussions, <laughs> it's it's good to talk about it and know that I can still remember some of this, man. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thanks for taking the time, Mike. Wes, I appreciate it, man. All, all the right. success, brother. And give my best to Matt. Dude, I will I for sure. Today. He said he's dying for a standard H hat. His blue one has faded now that he wore, he has worn it completely out. So he said, please let Wes know that he is in dire need. And well, he's in luck because I just got a fresh batch in. <laughs> yes. So standard hyphen H.com. <laughs> Dude, all over. Or it. tell him to just shoot me a text. It's no, all good. He, he's all about it. And look, I appreciate everybody that's listening. I appreciate what you're doing for uh, everybody out there spreading the stoke, spreading the word of what people are up to, entrepreneurs and legends and people that are just changing the way people look at stuff man i'm yeah, stoked man. for you thank you and i hope everybody you know enjoys it check us out at wakeboarding hall of fame.com yeah absolutely and uh i look forward to seeing everybody on the water sweet all right man we'll see you soon right on thanks brother thank you Huge thanks to Mike for taking the time. It's always great to see him and he's such an inspiration. I loved finding out more about his backstory and his career. Shout out to Clear Audio for the use of their headphones and to Jensen Reed and Super Beautiful for the theme music. Stay tuned until next Tuesday, which will bring you yet another edition of the Standard Age Podcast. Thanks for listening.